I now turn the event over to Professor Melanie Kamet, Director of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Thank you so much, Erin, and thanks to all the participants in this panel, uh, as also to the uh, interpreters, as Erin mentioned. Um, so I'm going to make a brief introduction um, and, uh, and, and then turn it over to our important discussion today. Um, we're very excited to host this event, this conversation with veterans from Bosnia, Herzegovina and Lebanon, who've dedicated themselves to peace building in their regions after conflict. I'm quite confident that we're going to learn a lot uh, from their insights about their experiences before, during and after the war in their respective countries. Uh, and along the way, uh, we're going to address important questions about war, peace, and the impact of war uh, legacies on future generations. Before I introduce the speakers, I wanna provide a very brief background to each of these conflicts. Uh, and it's not easy to do this because the narratives around these conflicts are contested. Uh, so I'm going to provide a sort of brief overview and overviews that have been uh, shaped very much by the participants in the panel today. Uh, so starting with the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina, this war arose out of the breakup of the former Yugoslavia, which at the beginning of the 1990s was one of the largest, most developed and diverse countries in the Balkans. It contained a number of republics in a larger federation of which Bosnia-Herzegovina was one, uh, and it included a mix of ethnic groups and religions, predominantly or from uh, the religions of Orthodox Christianity, Catholicism, and Islam. And with the collapse of communism during the late 1980s and early 1990s, Yugoslavia experienced intense crises and the rise of militant nationalism. So what we saw there, and this has important echoes in the Lebanese case and others as well, uh, was uh, a, a political leaders using nationalist rhetoric to erode a common identity and to fuel mistrust and fear among different ethnic groups. So by 1991, with the breakup of the country looming, uh, Slovenia and Croatia, two of the republics in the Federation of Yugoslavia, blamed Serbia for unjustly dominating Yugoslavia's government. Uh, and in turn, Serbia accused these two republics of separatism. In March of 1992, a referendum for independence was held in Bosnia-Herzegovina and was boycotted by Serbs from the country who wanted to stay in the Federation. Over 60% of Bosnian citizens and primarily Muslims as an ethnic group in that time and Croats voted for independence, uh, sparking the war. Uh, from 92 to 95, uh, the war in Bosnia uh, ripped apart the country. And now here we are 28 years later since the end of the war and Bosnia-Herzegovina continues to face trauma and unreconciled grievances that hinder intercommunal understanding. So today the narratives about the war have at least three different approaches reflecting the approaches of the three main ethnic groups. Uh, and, uh, and we will uh, hear from representatives of the different uh, armies that participated in the war, the Army of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Army of the Republic of Srpska, and the Croatian Defense Council. Uh, the last thing I want to say about this war before turning to Lebanon is that to this day, the total number of people killed is not yet uh, established, which reflects the lack of consensus about the nature and consequences of the war. So the span of estimated deaths ranges from over 95,000 to uh, as many as 250,000 people. Um, so let me briefly turn also to the war in Lebanon and provide a, a very short background. This war took place a little bit earlier between 1975 and 1990, and it ended uh, formally in 1989 with the Ta'if Accord signed in Saudi Arabia. Most reforms of that agreement are now incorporated in the political system of Lebanon. Uh, and about 256 organizations and militias took part in the fighting uh, of that war, 
Uh, and, uh, and if you are familiar with the course of the Lebanese war, it's actually more like a series of over 25 wars rather than one war. Um, the war began in 1975 with clashes between the Christian Kata'ib or Falange party and armed Palestinians. The Christians wanted to protect themselves from the Palestinian armed presence in the country, while Muslim and leftist groups allied with the Palestinians wanted to change the regime to get rid of the Christian dominance over the political system. Uh, a number of foreign actors fought on Lebanese soil during the war, including Palestinians of various factions, such as the PLO, the Syrian army, the Israeli army, multinational forces, the United States, France, and Iran. And again, here we have wide ranging estimates of the number of people killed uh, from 150,000 to 220,000. Uh, also about 600,000 people were injured, 900,000 displaced, uh, some people migrated as a result of the war, 17,400 people approximately disappeared and the costs of the war range into the billions and billions of dollars. Many Lebanese believe that the civil war never really ended because of the lack of true reconciliation, ongoing clashes in the territory to this day, and the ongoing presence of armed factions. So we see in both cases wars that in many ways remain under unresolved and intercommunal tensions and other kinds of political tensions are very high. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce the speakers and then we'll turn to the conversation. So first we have from Lebanon, Assad Shaftari. Uh, Assad is a peace activist and he is the vice president of an organization entitled Fighters for Peace. He is former senior intelligence official from a Christian militia in Lebanon uh, that was involved in the civil war. And his organization that he's going to be representing today includes ex-fighters from many different factions in the, uh, in the, in the war. And we have multiple people representing Bosnia-Herzegovina today. First, we have Jinana Shabic Hamidovic, who is National Project Officer with the International Organization for Migration. And I'm very grateful to her for introducing to me uh, these wonderful people participating in this panel. Um, we have Spasoye Kulaga, who is the founder and president of an organization called Pravi Pojar, in Bosnia-Herzegovina. He's a former member of the Army of the Republic of Srpska. We have Luciano Kaluza, who's a diplomat, holds a Master's of International Relations and Economic Diplomacy, and he's the former Consul General of Bosnia-Herzegovina. We have Asim Parlic, who's an activist, former counselor with the Zavidovici Municipal Council. He's a former member of the Army of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And we have uh, Mirko Zecevic Tadic, who's an activist and president of the retired war invalids 108th Brigade. He's a former member of the Croatian Defense Council. So I'm going to start with a, a couple of questions. I'm going to direct specifically to the veterans participating in our panel today. Uh, and I, I'll open up with uh, questions. I also want to emphasize to our attendees here today that we're going to try to leave some time towards the end of the conversation for your questions, uh, for you to pose questions. Uh, so let me start off uh, with a question um, about what life was like prior to the war for each of you. Uh, where did you live? What did you and your family members do prior to the war? And then if you could briefly tell us how the war started for you. So again, we have a number of veterans participating and I'm gonna ask that each of you try to keep your answers very brief just so that we can hear from everybody today. Uh, why don't I start with Assad representing the, the Lebanese veterans here? Thank you. Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, war for me, uh, it was a shock, you know. Uh, uh, I was 19 years old when it started, uh, and we just thought that it would be uh, clashes for some days as usual, you know, and then our politicians will would sit and uh, uh, solve it somehow or, uh, you know, distributing some, uh, some things between each other. But sadly, it, it lasted what it lasted, you know, un until 1990. I remember it was a, a Sunday. 
and we were coming back from church and it was maybe the last good uh, Sunday with the family that I had for many, many long, uh, long years. You know, Lebanon was uh, known as the pearl of the Middle East, but uh, sadly, things were disrupted a lot and until today we were uh, almost unable to uh, recover thank you thank you so much uh, can i turn to you spasoyer Good evening, good day. It's still daytime. I would like to greet you all and thank you for this opportunity to exchange experience in this way and hear about our past. Until 1992, I completed all of my education. I was a young man who had a job, I worked, I had very different plans for what my life was going to be, but just as you said, in our environment, in the former Yugoslavia, divisions began, the war started first in Croatia and Slovenia, and since I live on the very border, my city of Derventa is on the very border of the Republic of Croatia, the war also began in our town, we never believed that there would be war in our territory when it started in Croatia. We thought it would never reach Bosnia and Herzegovina, but in March of 1992, the war did come to my town as well. And as a young man at that time, I joined as a soldier, I joined what used to be the army of the Republic of Srpska. Um, it was the ethnic group that I belonged to, and I believe that this was the safest place for me to be at that time. Thank you so much. Um, Asim, can I turn to you? Is Asim connected? I don't think Asim is connected, and uh, I think, but Mirko is. Okay, so I'm going to turn to Mirko then. If you could share your experience about how the war started for you. I think we might having, be having some connection issues with Mirko. So maybe uh, until we get a sign from Luciano, we'll uh, go with Assad and, and Spazo for now. Okay, okay. Uh, apologies about all the technical difficulties. It's uh, challenging with everyone dialing in from different parts. Um, uh, so so let me turn to the war time then. Um, and I'd like to invite everyone to um, uh, to join us here on the panel. Um, so uh, perhaps we could actually start with um, some of the non-veterans here, and then I'll turn to the veterans. Uh, Janana, would you share with us a little bit about your experience during the war? I understand that you were present during the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Yes, first of, first of all, hi to everyone and everyone who tuned in to, to participate in the, in the event together with us. I was 11 years old when the war started in the country. Um, I was living in Tuzla. Uh, this is my uh, city of origin and where I was born and I spent the entire war, uh, the entire war there. Um, there is a joke that I usually make with my friends uh, saying that we only remember nice and good times uh, from the war there, I guess, because we were at that age. Um, Honestly, I must say that um, for me, remembering the war wartime experience is not easy. And I think that um, I have uh, strongly pulled out my defense mechanisms and pushed back uh, memories uh, from the war. However, I would say that there is one particular uh, day in the war, which is very uh, strange for me that I remember in, in, in its entirety in terms, uh, I remember when I was in the morning until the, uh, the evening of that event, it was um, 25th of May when uh, the grenade fell in Tuzla uh, and killed 72 young people, uh, ironically celebrating a day of youth at that day. The youngest victim uh, was uh, barely a year old. And that's the day that I remember from, as I said, from the morning until the, until the evening. Uh, so uh, other than that, yeah, I mean, it, it's not easy, as I 
said, and especially putting it in this context now, when you um, when you work in the peace building sector and trying to balance your own personal emotions of the war experience uh, and opening yourself to listen to the same experience of the people that at the time you understood were on the opposite side. Um, so that's why I, I was kind of very much appreciative of the work that Pravi Pojar is doing, bringing together veterans that <laughs> at one point were on opposite sides and now being able to speak about that experience uh, and actually um, spread it out and, and uh, have others share the same stories of how their experience in the war was. Thank you so much. I think anyone who's familiar with Bosnia, Herzegovina and Lebanon or many other uh, places around the world that have experienced conflict know that these legacies are deep and it's not easy to talk about this. And it's also not easy to do the kind of work that all these people are doing here. So it's uh, all the more reason to commend them. Um, Luciano, can I turn to you and ask you about your experience during the war? Uh, Melanie, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, greetings for, for all participants and also greetings for attendees that, that are participating and uh, listen our uh, forum. Um, I was 14 when the war started in Bosnia and Herzegovina, so I have a really good remembrance of the starting of the war and let's say in the before war period. So as Janana said, we are trying somehow to remember the war period just according to some nice periods or some some nice time in that period. So I, I think that's, let's say, human brains fu function like that, you know, are trying somehow to forget that all things that are, well, are not adequate or not good for, for your growth. Uh, I was 17 um, when the war stopped. At my 17th, let's say that was the last year of the war, I was engaged in so-called civil protection that was actually a work platoon. Um, in that platoon, there were the people who are not who were not member of the of the. I was grew up in a city called Teslic, that is one city in Republic of Srpska, at the border with the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in that work platoon, there were engaged people who was not member of the Army of Republic of Srpska. There was mainly civilians. At the end, uh, at the end of the war, the members of the work platoon was mixed from all at the end of the war, let's say from all ethnics. Um, and I was 17 when I was, let's say, engaged. But um, and I went to the front line and the first line to see to help, let's say, to the to the army. There's one joke. Uh, it was summer. I was sitting um, on some hill. It was really nice period. It was really great time, uh, August. And I was thinking, uh, what the youth in in other cities in the world in the Europe doing right now? Sitting somewhere at the sea, I don't know, swimming, having parties. And I'm sitting here in this forest. That forest actually was beautiful, but I don't see it like that. Sitting here for what? Why? Where and what what will happen to me? And all those questions when someone some someone old as 17 that I was was thinking in that period. So uh, actually that was the moment uh, that stay really deep into my memory. And that's the moment that gave me inspiration for later work in civil society in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that. I don't know if we have Mirko. Uh, connected to the audio now is is it possible to turn to him or is he still not able to connect okay um so uh let me know if we're able to get Mirko onto the audio um so let me um let me turn to uh Assad um and I know these are tough questions, but you've been in the business of handling tough questions for quite some time now. So um, so I wonder if you could share your experiences during the war, if there are some things you could share with us. And later we'll get to post-war experiences and your move towards peace building work. But if you yeah, could of course. Yeah, share some experiences. Yes. Uh... 
uh, I think I'd better put off my, uh, uh, stop my video because my internet is unstable. Can you, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Those of you that are familiar with Lebanon probably know that there's a major economic crisis going on and it's electricity is a major issue and telecommunication. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. Many, many issues nowadays. So uh, as a food soldier at the beginning of the war, being a student engineer, then an engineer, you know, I immediately took uh, part in organizing telecommunications, then some artillery. Then I was at the uh, in the nucleus that started the intelligence and security services of the Christian side, and I uh, uh, I was number two all all the way, you know. And our mission was to weaken the enemy and to defend ourselves. So you can imagine uh, everything I did, you know. The, the main issue I think was the clear conscience that I was at the end serving a, a holy cause, you know, because of uh, uh, trying to protect the Christians against the, the, the enemies who sadly for me were back then the uh, Palestinians, the pro-Palestinians among the Muslims, and the communist groups and uh, and so on. And I could go home with a really clear conscience, considering that what I was doing was a technical work, you know, to get rid of the uh, enemies. I felt that not killing civilians was enough uh, as, as a good, uh, for a good cause, you know, but sadly now I know it was not uh, the case. Uh, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, the idea was uh, all, uh, it all started, I think, when I was very, very young uh, in age. Uh, I don't think that uh, a civil war or a war starts when the first bullet uh, bullets are, are shot, you know. it's It was the first time I heard that there was another and that the other was so different and uh, was starting to become dangerous for the integrity of my community and my uh, and my country. Uh, so you can imagine the set of mind I was fighting uh, with during uh, this uh, this uh, long uh, civil war. Thank you so much. It sounds like uh, a sense of threat and fear for the welfare and uh, well-being of one's own community is an important motivator here um, and, uh, and drives uh, participation. Um, so can I turn to you, Spasoye, to tell us about your experience during the war, how you got caught up in it and and what your experiences were like during 92 to 95 in Bosnia Herzegovina. As I said, I am from Derventa, that is a city on the north of Bosnia and Herzegovina on the border, and we heard about the war in 91 when it was in Croatia. Uh, in the spring of 92, uh, the war from Croatia came into Bosnia. As I said, I felt the safest with my people in my ethnic uh, group. And and because of uh, from the Second World War II that uh, caused a lot of conflict among the people, among Serbian, Croatians, and the Bosnians. Uh, and all this, these narratives were transmitted. And I, and I found myself in the war. Uh, I was uh, the foot soldier. I was a soldier. And later on, uh, during the fights uh, in this area, uh, opposing to me were the Croatians, uh, the Croatian Defense Council, and the regular Croatian army as well that came from Republic of Croatia. So this was a conflict between two armies. We did not have a conflict where the civilians uh, were perishing, but as we soldiers say, uh, this was an uh, army war. Uh, in this war in 92, 
I was young when war started, and I frequently say I do not uh, uh, celebrate my birthday uh, because I start. I went to war when I was 23 in the summer of 92. Here in the fights in Derventa, I was also seriously injured, and uh, and uh, I uh, had my uh, leg amputated above my knee, and all this uh, changed my life, and I had to start and live a different kind of life. Uh, which was unknown to me. And because of what was happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I was a member of the army in some way, and I was contributing in the administration, more in the administration and not in the field, because physically I couldn't. But in one moment, I had to devote myself to myself and my health, which was the consequence of the war. And in war, there are some rules, but uh, in the war, you know, there are no rules. Uh, there should not be any mines in the war. However, uh, on the area of Bosnia and Herzegovina, these rules were broken, just like in any other war. And uh, I, uh, I uh, stepped on a mine and I got injured. And that was my war experience. Uh, in the war, there are terrible things. And in this area also. And in that period, I saw a lot of ugly things, a lot of death uh, of friends, of my school friends, of my acquaintances. And after some time, uh, since the Reventa and this area where uh, ethnically Serbs, Croatians, and Muslims lived together, I found out that many of my school friends and friends from work also were injured or that they lost their lives. I'm very sorry. I'm sure this has been really difficult. Um, so thank you uh, for sharing that with us. And um, I don't know that we have uh, Mirko or Asim with us now. Um, so doesn't seem to be the case. I'm sorry. Um, so um, so let me turn to uh, moving beyond the wartime period, uh, which is obviously extremely difficult and um, has long legacies. Um, so let's start to get at some of those legacies. Um, I'd like to hear what each of your lives has been like since the war. Um, how have you lived with the memories of what you underwent during the war? It's very clear that these memories are traumatic and um, and that many people, uh, you know, across Bosnia, Herzegovina, Lebanon, and other societies in the world are living with traumatic memories. Um, and uh, and if you could share with me something about how life has been like since 1990 in Lebanon, since 1995 in Bosnia Herzegovina, Assad, can we start with you again? Are you able to hear me, Assad? Yes, now I'm hearing you. Okay, great. Yeah. So I was just asking about life after the war. How you? Yeah, but I did not get your uh, your question. Please, can you repeat it? Absolutely. Yes, I'm turning to yes. post nineteen ninety. The war has ended, and can you take us through uh, something about your life after the war? Uh, how things evolved for you? Um, and how you've lived with the memories of what you underwent during the war. Yes. Uh, we may have a, a bad yes, connection. Uh, no, I did not uh, get all, all your... Yeah, I know, uh, sadly, yes. Uh, so I'll try to, uh, but tell me if you hear me properly or not. We hear you Can now. You hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, uh, luckily for me, I think that uh, uh, before the end of the civil war, I met a group 
called uh, moral rearmament. Then they changed their name into Initiatives of Change. It's an international movement who uh, who convinced my wife to join them. Then you know how women do convince their men. So I uh, I, I followed, and there you know they. Uh, they started asking me some uh, very peculiar questions like uh, you want to you want to change the lives of others and change others and make them uh, think like you and look like you and similar but are you ready to change uh, uh, what's within you first of course i never okay. thought that i had anything to change in me i was the, the a perfect uh, person uh, little by little, they took me through a very difficult mm -hmm. path of inner listening, you know, maybe to that inner voice or to God, for those who, who are believers, you know. And I discovered that I was very far from being pure, honest, unselfishness and loving. I was killing in the name of my own, you know, faith, maybe, or, or my own uh, beliefs. And uh, this also led me to look uh, at the mirror. And this is where I was shocked to, to see a, a beast with blood on the hands. I, I almost did not recognize myself. Uh, uh, what has happened to me? How uh, uh, did I become like this, you know? Uh, 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 and I started, you know, uh, thinking of changing. It was a long, long process. But during this process, I met the others who were, as I said previously, the Muslims, the pro-Palestinians, the Palestinians, the leftists, and so on. And this is where I discovered that most of what I thought about them was wrong. You know, I lived with a lot of prejudice, and uh, which was not necessarily true. Of course, we did not think like each other always. But there were many common things, you know, and at the end, they did not uh, they did not want, you know, to throw us outside the country, but they needed the changes in the uh, constitution and and similar. To my surprise, I discovered that they carried names and that I was uh, able to uh, to sleep with uh, with them in the same uh, room, maybe. And later on, I discovered that I have uh, uh, that I was able to work with them and to love them. And when I uh, uh, started loving them, they disappeared. Uh, by that, I mean that uh, th there were no other in my life between uh, uh, brackets. This led me later on to realize that I was asked to, uh, to, uh, to apologize for my deeds and uh, for everything I have done and ask for forgiveness. And this is what I did in an apology letter that I addressed to my victims. And in the same letter also, I said that I forgive those who had hurt me and my people. Uh, of course, this message was also addressed to the young people because I uh, wanted to prevent them from doing uh, or going, going through the same cycle that I had gone through. Change was very, very, very tough and very, very difficult, especially with all these scenes, bloody scenes of the of the of the war, you know. And someone uh, made a film in which I uh, I am part of, and he called it Sleepless Nights because of my experience uh, of sleepless nights after the war, which from time to time occur again and again nowadays. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. It's clear that you've done amazing work, both at the internal personal level and at the societal level. And um, in the uh, work I've been doing in uh, on post-conflict, post-war intergroup relations, I'm finding that reconciliation is truly rare, but it sounds like you've reached that higher state and it's quite impressive and a model for, for many people across the world. So thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, I think we do not have uh, two of our veterans from Bosnia-Herzegovina connected uh, properly. So um, Luciano, did you want to jump in here? I believe you're on mute. 
Luciano, uh, I'm in contact with, with Mirko, and I think that uh, he will be able to speak, but he just don't hear us. So I will I will send uh, tell him now to start to speak about his experience, hoping that we we will manage somehow to start it like that. Okay, I will send him text now. Okay, yes, we would love to hear a sort of brief overview of what his life was like prior to the war and how the war started for him and just take us through to um, his life after the war. It would be wonderful to get his perspectives. It looks like he might still be connecting, so maybe Spazo could give his answer just given, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Yes, Spaso, yeah, if you could uh, jump in, and then uh, and then Luciano can can Mirko step in after that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I listen to uh, the person from Lebanon, and I see similarities in the problems of the veterans in different parts of the world. Uh, veterans problems, the uh, soldier problems uh, is very similar. The differences are slight. I spent many nights, sleepless nights after war, very often, very frequent reminders for us here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where we live, in places where we were in war, and we walk by uh, where our friends died, where our friends got injured, where mishaps happened, and in one way, uh, our memory is rekindled every day after the war in 95 in one part i was trying to form a family i married i have two children and in one way here i tried to rehabilitate myself i had a job very often I was in contact with my friends from war. They were somehow some sort of support for me, and often I hung out with them. We organized ourselves, we had sports activities, and that was something that was a um, uh, support for each other within the ethnic group. And he just broke up. I could not hear. Uh, we lost the connection. Okay. And in this way, in this way, we try to deal with the issues and challenges, challenges of the army. So this life of veterans after the war is very difficult and time was needed so that we can become stabilized. And we didn't have much support from institutions uh, that dealt with our mental health. Uh, we ourselves had to find a way switch. Especially during anniversaries and some dates when we commemorate those killed, our friends during the commemorations, not so during those moments. I later heard that from my children. Uh, they said, during those days, we don't have our dad. He lives in a different world. Our family and the people around me noticed that that war also impacted me. That's it. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Luciano, I don't believe we have Mirko or Asim on the line. Are they, did they want to convey anything or shall we just move on? And I believe you're muted. Go on mute somehow. Um, I can't. I can't get Mirko or Asim. Unfortunately, I don't know what is the reason, but they will be there trying to connect. If they get connected, we will definitely give them word to say what what maybe uh, to share with us their experience. Okay. Well, uh, let me turn to to you then, Luciano, and then yeah. after it, Janana to uh, talk about this question about life after the war and how you personally, from a different vantage point, have been living with memories and how people around you have dealt with uh, post-war experiences. Um, I said to you that teenage period actually in my case, and I do believe in, in cases of many youth in the world, is a very sensitive period in, in their life. Um, as I said, I was 14 when the war started, when the war started, and in that period, uh, nothing was normal. We, but in, in some period, let's say war started in 1992, already in 1990, end of the 1993, 1994, 1995, somehow we get used to live in in that in that time when you have no electricity for all time when you have no water for all time um, you are living somehow um, closed um, and uh, when, the, when the war start somehow the life tried to get back to normal uh, you know all the all the all the all the pubs and everything start to open. And it was a very difficult time for someone who was not had it in the last couple year to start everything to work normal. And somehow I, I like to say that period after the war was one of the maybe the best period of my life because uh, people was hoping that there will be something different. People was hoping that okay, war is stopped. And now the, the situation, especially economic situation, will become much better. Um, on 1998, actually 1997 and 1998, uh, I gathered a group of youth in my town and we formed a youth NGO. It was called Youth Association Teslich. We started to work at this, as a youth NGO just to, to, to work. And I have to point this, um, before the war, um, civil society organization like this one right now, they were not existing in the form that they are existing now. There was civil society organization existing, existing uh, in some other manners, but uh, after the war uh, and with the strong influence of international community, I can say maybe all, not, well, I can't say all, but um, let's say many of NGOs that was formed after the war that was formed under the influence uh, of international community and international NGOs. So they're starting to make this NGO through the whole Bosnia and Herzegovina, giving them especially support and advice how to build NGOs. As I said, we were kids in that period, you know, some 19 years old, starting to do something. We start to work on, on a project, to write the project uh, project proposal to get some funds to, to start to do something with youth education, trainings, to travel. The, the, the main important thing for, for us in that period was to travel, to go somewhere else. We, you know, the, the cities that, that was closed in that period. You can't go to the nearest city in, in the war. It was really complicated. Um, and we wanted to travel. Uh, the, pro, the, the As I said, as I was living uh, at the in the town that was at the border of Republic of Srpska, at the border with Federation, many of my 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 colleagues in in that period uh due to um consequences of war they go to the let's say other 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 side and um they stay i want to see where they are now what they are doing uh are they okay that was some my my friends from from my street from my buildings and uh, I go to Federate. I remember that period, the um, United Nations bus was organized from Teslich to, to the Federation to go there. And I went to that bus. I was, I don't know, that was the 
second or third time that that bus was going from Tesla to the Federation to go there to drink coffee to see how it's going on in 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 Federation what is going on there. I went to drink coffee, get back, and after that we start to communicate with the youth from from the other entity. I want to point this that uh, before the war in Yugoslavia, there was that syntagm that 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 said that brotherhood and unity. That was some sort of ideal that we the society was toward and aimed to. Uh, and uh, my intention as someone who was formed youth NGO was not to find any type of brotherhood or unity with anyone else, or I don't know, just want to drink coffee to, to, to go somewhere and to see how someone is living on the other side. So that was my my and my friend's personal attention. Um, we start, I personally started to work with NGOs, starting to write project proposals, working with youth, travel, educate myself, educate colleagues with me through the formal and informal education. Uh, and um, being in member as a member of NGOs give me um, give me some sort of different perspective from the from the uh, my colleagues and my friends that were not members of any NGOs. So actually, uh, I wanted as I say in my speech, uh, my engagement was was the main reason for my engagement was uh, so the youth in Bosnia Herzegovina never had that experience that I have and that I passed, I think that is not normal period, that is not normal experience, that is not for a human normal to, to live and to have it in their lives. That for me, that, that is a period when you need to become a person, grown growth person with, with your attitude, with your, with your personality, and you were stuck in that war time. So my intention was just to work with the youth, to travel, to see, and to show to the youth and the people from the other side that uh, we are not any monsters or whatever, just normal people who are trying to live their lives normally with, without seeking for that unity and brotherhood. That was not my intention, and it was never my intention. My intention is just to see other people, to see how they live and try to communicate try to find something new and um, post-war period and i can't divide maybe later i will take a little bit more time post-war period um we can divide into a several periods for me and uh, and that period is going a little bit you know like this after the the, the war in bosnia and herzegovina because uh it was not always uh going up sometimes it was going down but uh, definitely, I I will I will take a little bit of time at the end at, at the maybe last or, or question or something like that. Okay, thank great. You. Uh, thank you so much. Fascinating. So I'm going to turn to Janana now to um, take us through her experience um, since the war. And I want to add on another question that I'd like to pose to everyone on the panel for some brief answers as well, because we're also starting to amass some really excellent questions in the Q&A that I want to turn to. Um, so Janana, if you could tell us uh, about your experiences after the war, how you personally have dealt with these difficult memories. And then also, I want to move into this question of why you chose to become active in peace building. You are, after all, with the IOM. You are the person that has connected me with these incredible veterans from Bosnia-Herzegovina. So clearly, you made that choice as well. Um, and so I wonder if you could take us through to that. And then I want to briefly, after that, turn to the veterans and ask about um, their peace building activities, what they do very briefly, and, and then we'll turn to the questions from the participants, from the audience. Okay, thank you. Um, I was um, actually before preparing for this uh, panel, I was thinking how, and that, that question came to me a long time ago, um, and it's still something that I struggle, struggle to, to accept as a part of my identity, is that actually I lived through the war. And um, I think that something, I'm 40 plus years now, uh, but somehow I'm really struggling to identify myself as a person who has lived through the war. And um, to I think it's a part of def def defensive mechanisms uh, that I spoke to, uh, before. However, um, as opposed 
to to what Luciana said. I don't know. For me, um, ever since I finished uh, primary school, I was a, a captain of our volleyball team. And in Bosnia, there was these uh, newspapers called Mirko that were uh, distributed uh, across the country uh, by U4, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. And they were kind of interviewing um, students from primary schools, secondary schools, uh, trying to bridge us and connect us uh, through these different sports activities. And I gave interview for that news, um, that newsletter, Mirko, uh, in which I said that I would really like to get to know my peers in the other entity, the entity in Republika Srpska. And uh, without getting consent of my parents, I have left my phone number and my home address for people to reach out to me. Um, and kind of connect <laughs> connect there. Um, yeah, sorry to say that after a couple of weeks, we have to change our phone numbers. Uh, phone number, uh, because we had lead lines. Back then, there were no, <laughs> there were no cell phones. Because I have, I, I mean, I have received also positive phone calls. People really wanted to connect, but also there were people who called attacking me uh, because of that. And uh, my father was a, was a military uh, staff and uh, was a, is a veteran in the, from the army of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And there was also some of the, um, some of the messages was very cruel also toward, toward that experience. However, I have received a couple of letters um, from one girl from Rudo, which is on the border uh, between Bosnia and Serbia next to Visegrad. And one guy uh, from Kneževo and Zavidovic, uh, actually, we exchanged letters. And I keep those letters to date. Uh, now we are friends on Facebook. Uh, that kind of remind us that we connected back in 95, 96. Um, and so I knew uh, after living through that experience as, I think, 14-year-old, I knew that uh, peace doesn't have an alternative, uh, actually. Um, maybe it's weird to say that thing, but somehow... Um, that's that's something that I, I I was lucky not to lose anyone in the war uh, from the close family. I, I lost some of the friends um, and, and acquaintances. Uh, but however, I knew that you know go, going through that experience that, that there shouldn't be alternative to war uh, to, to peace, and that you know um, even though we are not, as Luciano rightfully pointed out, that brotherhood and unity, because apparently the war that demonstrated to us that that was some construct not apparently lived uh, genuinely by everyone, but that, that at least there is no alternative to, be, to live peacefully with each other, um, to be able to communicate uh, on the level of the human beings, understand each other. And I think that um, all the peace building trainings have taught me that I need to be able to understand the other side. Even if I don't agree with certain things, I need to be able to understand where is that coming from? Where is that experience coming from? And how that experience shaped the person in front of me to be able to understand um, our differences uh, ultimately. And um, when I had a, so I'm gonna jump now fast forward for my work in uh, I am and how I met Spasse. Uh, um, some of our friends, we had, we had common friends uh, that were also peace building activists. So when I started working for IAM, we had this huge program, Bosnia and Herzegovina Resilience Initiative, that kind of, um, after analysis of the context, we understood that politic politics uh, in Bosnia have captured the narrative of the war. And that is very difficult to uh, pull through that. And so one common friend, uh, Milan, who actually now works with IAM as well, but he used to be a really genuine peace activist in ex Yugoslavia, he told me you should meet Spasoje. So I jumped on a car and drove to Derventa to meet with Spasoje, and we discussed about their work and everything that they are doing. And on my way back, uh, when I came uh, when I came to our team and I said, I met Spasoje, it's amazing. They do amazing things. We need to get behind them. We need to get them in front of the youth. Like it's amazing stories. And one of our colleagues uh, stopped me and he said, is he a veteran from Army of uh, Republika Srpska? And I was like, I have no idea. And you like, what do you mean you have no idea? And I said, well, we talked so much about the war that we never actually get to the chance to speak about, you know, belonging to army there that we spoke about what is the, you know, what was the experience, how this needs to be uh, about that. And then I told this to my dad and, and I told him like, you know, it's the first time I ever heard um, a, a, a soldier who is not you, <laughs> you know? And um, 
I think that, uh, yeah, the work that we keep doing um, and that we, we really stand, stand behind the, the Pravi Pajar, um, many people would say, but you know, there are politics and this is, that they are not entering into the politics spheres. And I don't think that they should at this stage. You know, I think that um, them breaking, uh, breaking the silence in terms of experience of veterans and what does that meant to them, how they live today and how that affected their families is something that kids and young people in Bosnia need to hear. Because when you, I, I mean, experiences, people who still, who, who have been born after the war, unfortunately think that the war is a, is, is a you know, like Nintendo game, that um, you die, and uh, you know, in this game of the war, and then tomorrow you get uh, another chance. And I think that the experience uh, from the veterans actually need to break down those myths, that the war is not an option, uh, not even a latest one, and that it doesn't make you uh, superhero and it doesn't make you, you know, uh, like this macho strong guy that, uh, and of us opposite, he doesn't actually uh, do anything to you but break you, as Paso was saying, and that you have to pull yourself back together because, as we heard in Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's not that veterans have so much support um, through the mental health care system and also through, through, uh, through some other systems. So um, that actually is my driving force. Uh, you know, I think that we need to demystify uh, the war being this uh, superhero uh, field in which you get to show your strength and, and uh, courage. But I think, I think the strength and courage are behind the table. And as rightfully Spasso once said, spending days and days negotiating before you take arms. So, yeah, that's what drove me to peace building and that's what still keeps me going. I think Asim is here. If he can hear us, it would be great for him to also see. Yes, I was going to see if we can turn to Asim and uh, and then after that, I'm going to, in the interest of time, turn to some of the excellent questions uh, no. in the Q&A. Um, so Asim, if, if you're there, uh, very briefly, if you could share a little bit about sort of a, you know, a quick quick summary of your experience before the war, during the war, after how you got to where you are now. Um, that would be great. And then I'm going to turn to some of these excellent questions. Do we have uh, awesome? Good evening to everyone um, or day. I'm very sorry that I had uh, technical difficulties and couldn't uh, join right away. I am joining you now over the phone. Before the war, I was born in a working family in a very small place, Zavidovici, in the, the middle of Bosnia. And until the war, I lived in an apartment in a building that housed the railway station because my father was a railroad worker and we had an apartment there. So at the railway station, I went, also completed um, my elementary school here eight-year elementary school. I had to cross eight kilometers to school every day and eight kilometers back. And then in mid-eighth grade, I was asked, uh, there was a competition to apply to a military school and I applied and was admitted. And so it was a military academy in Belgrade where I spent four years and that military academy was a high school. And that was the basis um, for com continuing to go to a real military academy in the former Yugoslavia. So after finishing this military high school, I enrolled in the military academy in Belgrade where I spent two years. I was in an auto mechanic uh, unit. Um, I completed it in Banja Luka, the military academy. I got the rank of officer and started working in Pristina. That was where my job, first job position was. And, um, and I spent um, four years there until the beginning of the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I was in Pristina until the beginning of the war. And then at my request, I left JNA, former JNA, 
and came back to Zavidovici, my hometown, and I spent the entire war there. After the war, I retired as an officer of the armed forces of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I'm currently retired. I'm married. I have one child, and I live in Zavidovici. Okay, thank you so much. And um, uh, I'm going to turn to some of these questions, but I want to also emphasize that uh, that all of these um, uh, veterans and now peace activists are uh, doing a lot of important work, reaching out into their communities and doing a lot of public events, whether it's in schools, community organizations, or whatever it might be, to try to... Um, share the important lessons they've learned from their experiences and to promote uh, more peaceful relations in their societies. So in some of our answers, hopefully we can get a taste of the kinds of activities that they're engaging in, because I think that will relate to some of the questions we're getting here. So let me try to pose, package up some of these questions together um, because we really have some excellent questions here. And um, sometimes they're directed at a particular panelist, but I think they actually apply to everyone here, particularly to the veterans. So um, from uh, Mohammed Izakzadeh, um, we have a question about you know, what the reaction of one's community is when you try to reach out to rivals, to former rivals, uh, to seek reconciliation and forgiveness. And also, um, and how, how do people um, from different communities respond to this? We've had a little bit of taste of this when, for example, Janana talked about how her landline was getting inundated with not just positive messages, but negative messages as well. <laughs> um, so I'd like to pose this question to the panelists, and I'd also like to group it together with some related questions that are coming in um, from uh, some of our guests here, some who are calling in from Bosnia or are originally Bosnian. Um, one of our uh, guests uh, notes that um, their family continues to struggle with forgiveness. Forgiveness is not easy um, and, and, uh, and have passed on the idea of fear and distrust of members of other communities um, and even of close friends who they say can betray you. So how would you counsel the, the parents of children who've lived through the war to um, speak about this with their children, to help facilitate conversations about forgiveness and growth in relationship building. Um, and then uh, one more question I'd like to um, uh, pose to sort of put with this group of questions, a related question is, what message can you send to young people nowadays who are expressing hate and even violence on the basis of national, ethnic, or religious differences uh, against their neighbors. So if we could um, address those sets of questions about, you know, drawing on your experiences, what advice would you give? Um, and how are you working to promote forgiveness and reconciliation? And what kinds of reactions have you received from other members of your societies, especially from your own community? So Assad, I'm going to turn to you to start with this. I know you have a lot to say about this. We've talked about this in the past. <laughs> Yes, indeed, we did. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 there are some things that a, a government or a state should do at the end of a war. And sadly, in Lebanon, for example, we did not go through any process of, uh, of uh, reconciliation apart from uh, our politicians sitting together, maybe, and dividing the cake. But... Uh, uh, at the level of the grassroots, nothing, uh, nothing was done, you know, and anything related to the transitional justice process uh, was not uh, done. The only thing done was a, an amnesty law, uh, uh, unconditional amnesty law, sadly. Uh, and uh, uh, recently, two or three years ago, uh, uh, a department to look for the disappeared and take care of their families. This, these were the only things done. Uh, 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 and uh, 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 the parties or the groups or the militias which took part in the civil war were not dismantled. 
and which worse also, the communities are still there and they're still hoping, you know, to keep a good image for the future uh, in front of those who are face, still between brackets facing, facing them. So uh, someone from this group going out and saying, listen, guys, I'm sorry for what I did and I want to reconcile with the other is, uh, is like an act of, uh, it's like you are a, a, a traitor, you know, they consider you as a, as a traitor. Uh, while my surprise was to uh, to see that the uh, reception from the other side was uh, surprising, you know, uh, uh, was so generous, you know, it's as if uh, they were there waiting for a Christian person to come forward and say, listen, guys, we're sorry, we did very bad things, and not accuse them also of these things. You know, one should not, when apologizing, should not give reasons why he did this or did that. A bad thing is a bad thing. You know, this is uh, uh, this is important. An apology should not be political only. It should come from the heart. It should come from the conscience and uh, and so on. Now, regarding uh, forgiveness, uh, it's a very, very uh, difficult thing. It's difficult to forgive. And it's also difficult to come forward asking for uh, forgiveness. And uh, uh, I mean, in not all cases, you can see someone, a perpetrator, come forward and saying to, to a victim's family, please forgive me. So it, it makes it more difficult for the, for the families uh, to, uh, to without seeing someone in front of them explaining uh, what happened and that has to be done to heal uh, to heal uh, the hearts you know and heal the future uh, because the one who carries hatred in his heart uh, the other are not feeling the others are not feeling it he is the one suffering from it this is uh, what I try, try to explain to people who, who come forward to, to, uh, to take my, uh, uh, my uh, advice. Now, for, for the youth, you know, they should understand, as uh, uh, Madame uh, Hamidovic uh, said, you know, that uh, hatred, non-communication, uh, violence, uh, uh, war are not something, you know, that you can uh, uh, do easily and get out e easily. It's not uh, only about facing the other, you know, in a war or something where you are the hero and they have to lose or one of the two sides uh, uh, have, uh, have to lose. In, in, in wars, you know, everybody loses. And this is very important to understand, you know. Uh, 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 ones who win lose somewhere and those who lose lose of course so it's important to teach them that uh, war is not the answer violence is not the answer there are tens if not hundreds of answers uh, before uh, something that we should never reach i mean which is the military uh, the military uh, violence and that Living together is really much more beautiful than any day during the war, you know. We should always stress on how ugly it was, how uh, how hard it was, how uh, bloody it was, and uh, that uh, it's never, never danced. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, Spasoya, would you like to jump in? No, I... Yes. First, I see in this conversation that this internet is really against uh, us veterans because we have this problem here. We veterans have this problem, as I can see. And to us, it is really important, and our model of work is to hear the voice of veterans. And I'm very sorry Mirko couldn't come to join us, because the model of our work, of our association, is to hear from all three parties in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and so that we have three narratives uh, when we talk, uh, and we really want this to happen, and these technical um, problems are really making this difficult for us. And this is reminding us uh, of our uh, first um, meeting. 
Many international organizations and institutions do not want to work together with war veterans, and we have a lot big problem here because they don't want to, from some reasons, uh, part of the veteran population uh, is to the right, and it is with the politics, but uh, there is a generalization that they don't want to work with the veterans and they do not want to cooperate with them. Uh, the reaction of the community where we live, these reactions are, uh, I can say, uh, some are judging us and the others are saying that we are doing a good work and the third, they, they are just quiet. So some are judging us. Um, we do have some uh, encouragement and support, and we have some that say nothing. They don't want nothing to do with it. Uh, forgiveness, it's a big thing. I also take part in many programs where uh, you address the victim, whether the victim was a civilian or a, a soldier, you have to talk. If you do that to the victim, and if you do this from an uh, ethnic uh, group, uh, and if you go where all these uh, happenings were, uh, I will be judged uh, from my own group. So not many people will support me in this. On this, this territorial part of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where you have the Republic of Srpska and the Federation, and we have also division of three people. And it's very difficult when you do a human uh, gesture and when you honor the ones that were lost, uh, uh, then, you know, the other side uh, can uh, shame you because you either were the traitor to your own or in a way uh, you are judged uh, from the other side because you shouldn't be appearing here where all these uh, uh, killings happened. So in this country, whatever you do, in, in a way you are always uh, under uh, the looking glass and we want to honor the people who were lost. So we people, the civilians, want to do something that is good in our program. Uh, as I said, uh, we have three veterans in our program, and they work with the youth, and they uh, the constructive use of veterans' experience is the program, and we are very proud of this program because the experiences of the war veterans are important to prevent violence uh, um, among the youth, and they need to hear from us, from me, and ask him how it was to be in the war, how it is to see all those killings, and how is it to live with all this. And here is the hidden answer, uh, how do you work with the youth, and what is it that we counsel them? We don't give them uh, advice, but we give them a chance to talk with the war veterans and hear their experiences, and then they are aware enough to learn from these experiences and to realize that uh, uh, war is not an interesting experience, that there are consequences to the war, and uh, so we do not have enough uh, resources to talk about how it affects the family too, and how women uh, participated and uh, young people. And we have a lot of workshops here in Bosnia and Herzegovina that we uh, deal with and we encourage them to work together, work with the, the parents. We want to live. Uh, your parents were in many different uh, uh, circumstances and uh, they could be poisoning uh, 
us with some uh, what some things what we went through and we want them to be educated uh, and to be engaged in this association very often we encounter a judgment uh, of veteran association in republika srpska i'm sorry uh, he's breaking up could not hear okay it, it looks like we lost him but i know luciano wants to jump in and then i'm going to pose one or two more questions because we have about 10 minutes left Okay, um, Spasio, give me a great intro. Maybe for the for your next question, I don't think that 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 uh, about political general generally situation in in Bosnia Herzegovina. Give me that great intro when he said uh, from all sides uh, he get uh, his association give reaction. You know, from from one side, second side, and the third side. Um, we have to be honest towards ourselves and um, and and toward um, international community. Bosnia and Herzegovina is deeply divided society. Um, it's deeply divided because of uh, different uh, and complex set of historical, cultural, political reason. They are primarily uh, along ethnic and religious lines with three major ethnic groups. Maybe just the people uh, to know that the Bosniaks and Bosnian Muslims, Croats, uh, Catholics uh, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Serbs, uh, Orthodox Christians. Uh, and also there is so-called the others, the people that are not belong one of those three groups. Uh, and um, this division uh, is not started in 1992. 1992 was just the continuation of the pre previous period. And the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I get uh, often, and I said it uh, that it's just continuation of of the Second World War. But also, Second World War was somehow um, did not start because of itself. Uh, in, in, in former Yugoslavia. Also, there is roots before. So um, complex situation, historical situation after the, the Ottoman Empire in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Austria, Hunger, Hungary in, uh, 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 Empire in, in this area provide different cultural and historical narratives. So uh, all the way, all the way we have that uh, so so called uh, 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 lines that are going uh, among us with the lines of division and uh, even from 1945 when uh, when the socialist federative republic of yugoslavia was created even in that period when when the people trying to uh, make that division uh, 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 invisible, they still persist in the people. There was there in the people. No one worked with the people from 1945 to 1992 uh, with dealing with the past. No one worked with them and to see what happened in 1994. As Pastor said in the beginning, some of the war crimes in, in whole Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, was, uh, was repeated from the war crimes that happened all, let's say, almost in the same area in the Second World War. That is give us a strict point that we need to work more on process dealing with the past. And when we are, when we are talking about the reconciliation, I like to say that it is very hard to achieve reconciliation on the way that is written in the books, that we have to forgive. We said, okay, now we will make reconciliation and we will be happy in the world. I think that we need to work on our recon uh, uh, reconciliation of our attitudes, that we have to understand that the Bosnia and Herzegovina is deeply divided politically, especially, but also by ethnic and religious line. To understand that division is uh, present here, and we need to adopt it like that and start to act in line with that. We can't build one nation in Bosnia and Herzegovina. You know that there was that uh, there was that period in, in Austria-Hungary uh, uh, in, in, uh, kingdom, let's say, uh, when when there was, um, in, after the Congress of Berlin, uh, there was 
appointed a person who was called Benjamin Kala. He, he works a lot to try to create one nation in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And there was strong movements from Serbia, from the Croat, Croat side. Not from, we can't go in that direction. We need to work with the people, with the people attitudes. Uh, Serbian people feel the, the, the most comfortable with the Serbian majority. Bosnian people feel feel most comfortable with the Bosnian majority and Croat people feel most comfortable with the Croat majority. But does, that does not mean that we need to hate each other. That does not mean that, that, need, that we have to point fingers to others and say, look who you are and look what you are looking, uh, what you are looking uh, on. And, and, and try to uh, establish society that, that uh, we'll go to the European Union healthy society with all our uh, specifics in the religion and the ethnic background. And there is also, um, somehow when we are trying to build our society, somehow when we are trying to build our society, there is always influence from some other side that somehow try uh, not to give us that possibility to do that. Um, I'm also in favor that we in Bosnia and Herzegovina need to uh, negotiate more and to find common decision in the context of the situation and especially toward the European Union. I think that some, sometimes, uh, and I, I, I will be, I'm, I'm quite often, uh, quite often in our media, especially in the Republic of Srpska, and I uh, think that sometimes uh, international organizations have a lot uh, this uh, after the war period and help us a lot to uh, to create and try to rebuild our society in some sort of uh, economic, uh, social, and uh, any other ways. Uh, uh, they help us to try, uh, with 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 uh, things that maybe we alone could not do that in such a, a fast period. But now somehow like they are trying to stop us to do things that we need to do. Like there is someone from the side said, okay, that what you are trying to achieve between yourselves, that is not good. We will tell you what is maybe the best for you. I think that period is over. The period of the strong influence of international community in Bosnia and Herzegovina need to stop and give the people in Bosnia and Herzegovina, leader, politicians, even the people don't like politicians in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay, I, I think the people don't like politicians anywhere in the world. Let's say that they don't like them in the France, they don't like them in the Germany. Um, they are elected and they need to take, of course, they're elected, they have obligations. So, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina do have some sort of future, just in the context if we, if Bosnia and Herzegovina, negotiate among ourselves, not waiting from someone else from the other side to be part of our internal uh, decision making. And in that context, I'm looking this period of, of so-called, as I said, reconciliation of attitudes to uh, speak about the war, to speak the, the, about pre-war period, after the war period, uh, and do everything uh, not uh, to, to stop the possible moments or to stop the possible even thinking that the war is solution for something. War is not, and conflicts are not solution for anything. And I do believe that we will never have have war in 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 Bosnia and Herzegovina, I would like to say in the region, I definitely want to be positive and think that uh, we finished with all of it. We need to build our society to to have our youth, to have our children, to educate them, to uh, to be the best sports in the scientists in in Europe, and give us uh, from us to give the best to the world in that context. I think that uh, we alone in Bosnia and Herzegovina and with the help of those veterans, those veterans give strong influence of building normal society, just to listen to them, what they have to say, what is the war, what is the trauma, and how do they live now and in this period after the war. They have so much to say, and we can build society with mutual respect. We can't build society common, equal, one society we can build society on a mutual respect mutual respect and that is what i that is what my intention is just to have mutual respect without all differences that we are living here at, at the end when you walk into a garden you would like to see many fl different flowers uh with a you know different colors and everything it's much beautiful to see it like that and try somehow to organize it to to live 
uh, uh, in that in that garden without any problems, you know. And I think that that is the, the main future of Bosnia and Herzegovina to reduce the influence of international community and to give more strength to the to the to the to the people from Bosnia and Herzegovina to make their own decisions. Sorry for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's really valuable. Um, before I turn to you, Janana, and the, our veterans from Lebanon and Bosnia-Herzegovina, I just want to say we won't unfortunately have time to get at all of these excellent questions. We only have a couple minutes left, but I want to highlight some of the important themes that our uh, attendees have raised about the role of memorials, for example, um, which may be important as part of the healing process for people, but under some conditions can also be rather divisive as well. And I think the questions reflect this. Um, and also about the fact that here we are um, many years after these wars and uh, and we have, um, you know, warlords from the from these uh, wars that are holding political offices and remain the major political actors uh, right now. Um, and we have really ratcheting up tensions. One of our questions uh, from the audience raises the issue of um, early warning signs. What can we learn from your experiences about uh, what to look for, you know, in uh, in the lead up to war that maybe people missed back before the wars broke out in Bosnia and Lebanon. These are all important questions to think about that we don't have time to answer now. Um, and, you know, obviously the situations are quite tense in Bosnia, and Herzegovina and Lebanon. So if uh, Janana and then uh, I'll turn to the veterans, if you could each say just 30 seconds or no or or less uh, concluding remarks, Janana. Yeah, um, I just wanted, I, I wanted one of the things, uh, I saw two questions in the in the panel, which actually, uh, Melanie, uh, you also pointed out. Um, one of these things was how to put the past to rest. And I think that what we heard also from um, Assad, from Luciano, what was, uh, what was in, in partially saying now, um, uh, our experience here, uh, here in Bosnia, as, as you should, Luciana thoroughly explained previously, um, has taught us that we cannot put anything under the carpet. And that is precisely why we support the work of the Pravi Pajar veterans, is because we believe that everybody deserves to say the truth. And that there is that we need to have a space in which people can express uh, their own feelings, their own opinions, and moderating that, as, as Luciana was pointing out, with the respect toward, uh, toward each other. Because our experience for Balkans has taught us that as long as you are, many truths were forbidden in our long history of many of hundreds years. And many times we have been um, under the, how do you say, uh, I'm trying to find the right word. Um, one narrative was opposed throughout the different times. And of course that narrative was changing. And so I, I believe firmly that we need to put in our peace building work here, one different factor. Because if we keep doing the same thing throughout the past 100, 500 years, expecting different results, well, not to be uh, rude, but then we are fools. So we need to change something in our approach. How do we deal with the past experiences and how do we deal with those difficult topics? Without, uh, many would say, and but Spasoy was, was speaking about that, many would say, and many critiques of their work would say that they are um, kind of, it's a relativization, it's making everybody, you know, like everybody did everything. As I said at the beginning, their work is not to speak about politic, uh, politic nature of the war. Their work is about to speak about human experience of the war, which majority of the war, war experience is how common people choose to, or not choose, how they end up in war, what, what is their behavior, what, what determines um, what their, their war experience is uh, uh, there. And this is how we can put the past to rest, by speaking about what happened, by allowing people to share the experiences. And even if we don't agree with those, it's their truth. Many would say that Bosnia and Herzegovina, as, as, um, as Lujano was saying, that in across the country, we have a different war experiences. Me knowing war experience from Tuzla doesn't make me expert on the war experience in central Bosnia or 
what happened in the western part of the country or what happened in the northern part of the country. I have to be able to open myself to hear the experiences of the people across the country to be able to understand and form some sort of opinion about the war. So that's one question. The second one, and that's my last, I promise, I'm, that's, that's it, I'm done. Um, here it's about the memorialization. I'm sorry that Spassway didn't spoke more about that because I know for the fact that they do go around visiting certain memorials and paying respect to the victims um, in the different, uh, different memorials. And I know how much they have suffered uh, by being in some of the places where, as he was putting it, they were not accepted uh, to be there. There is, a, however, a movement in the country who does memorialization. There is an organization called Center for Nonviolent Action. It's a regional uh, initiative. They do amazing peace building work across the region and uh, they do uh, proper memorialization. However, as I said, because as Assad was actually saying, regardless of the work we do on the higher levels, if we don't put it down to the very community who suffered, who experienced, who went through the war and discussed it there, everything you do up there has a little, little, little effect. And also speaking to the Bosnian experience when it comes to the war crimes, um, uh, court decisions, unfortunately, most of them were made in different country miles away physically from the Bosnia and Bosnian uh, Bosnian court system. So whenever the decision uh, and the verdict was made against um, for the for the war crimes in the country, we have left politicians and the media to spin it in a way that they felt suitable, depending which which uh, which army uh, the, 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 the person who was uh, convicted belonged without going down to the specific community that that specific crime concerned to speak about them, what does that mean to them and how do they see this? This is why we still have a denial of the war crimes across the country. This is why we are still debating about the court verdict because we haven't put it close to us. They have been made different, uh, you know, far away from us and it's not there, we don't feel it. So we have to change the way we do peace building, although it hurts, although not everybody can agree with it, but we have to be able to open up a space for people to truly share their experiences with respectable and understandable way. That's it. I'm sorry I took some time of you. Uh, Thank you. It's all incredibly valuable. Unfortunately, we are now over time, but I don't want to leave without letting our veterans say some parting words. So Asad, can I start with you very briefly? Yes, uh, very, very briefly. I would say that we should not despair from anybody uh, or the possibility of changing anybody. And we always answer by saying that if we were able to change, if I was able to change, then anybody else can change. And uh, thus situations can change. This is my first uh, last message. The second one is don't isolate, that you should not isolate the politicians because we need them to listen to us. If we put them in a box, you know, and I don't want to deal with you, I won't be of a help for them. Uh, you know, they should listen to us to be able to change. Uh, uh, thirdly, each one of us uh, citizens, you know, can be the source of this change. You know, and uh, finally, we should not forget uh, to work on those who nourish this uh, divide culture, you know, uh, like uh, uh, education, educators, like uh, media, like clergy, maybe, uh, and, uh, and so on. So uh, work on the level of grassroots, of the elite, but also on the intermediary, uh, intermediary uh, levels. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pasoya, uh, very brief. Yes, as far as the days panel, um, it's also dedicated to the Day of Peace. We are a Veterans Association. Tomorrow is the Day of Peace, and as such, we are working from the village through the town, the town institutions, and all the way up to the top as far as we can go. We start with the grassroots, go all the way to the top. We work on the terrain as well, 
we start with a small person, their family. If we establish peace there, we know that we've done a good thing. As far as working with the youth, um, the youth is interested in that past. We have some experience there and the youth have questions and want to learn about it. And I'm pleased because of that. I'm an optimist. Um, I'm hopeful because it motivates me for my work in the next period that, that the young are interested in the past. They want to learn from it so they don't repeat the mistakes that we had done by entering the war. Janana said something about the commemoration, so that's a big thing. Going and bowing to the victims of who belong to the other nations. I personally participated and as a person um, that regardless of all the judgments I experienced, um, what, the hand uh, uh, given to me by the family of the victims um, from the ethnic group that I don't belong to is a very big deal for me. Not everything is black. Something like that shows me that something is changing in this country and I will use that opportunity tomorrow to say that tomorrow on the day of peace something positive is changing and that someone who is a war veteran and a peacemaker and an activist will be um, pronounced um, the peace activist of the year and that will be me and uh, that kind of support from work that I get also gives me hope. Um, there is somebody from the institution. I have a very bad cooperation during all of these processes uh, that we discussed today. Thank you very much for the time that you spent with me, for the opportunity. Um, this is a very big topic uh, that requires a long discussion and exchange of opinion. But I think in the, in the next period, uh, we have established a good contacts and we will be able to uh, contribute to the peace in the world. Thank you for the support and thank you so much to the interpreters um, and everybody from my association for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know if Asim wants to say something very briefly at the end, if we have him on the line. Okay, sounds like he's not connected. But let me, uh, well, first of all, let me thank the amazing Weatherhead staff for facilitating this um, and for making this happen. Uh, I, we're, we appreciate everything that you do. And, uh, and I really wanna thank the participants in this panel. Each and every one of you is doing extraordinary work. I have said this to you previously, I'll say it again. If the world were filled with human beings like you, we would be in a much, much better place. So please keep up the excellent work that you're doing. You're very inspirational. You can see from the messages we're receiving that you've touched many people. And um, we are grateful for the work that you've done. And um, and it, it we clearly have more work to do. And you are playing a very important part in this world in doing that work. So thank you very much for joining us.